Hello and welcome to another episode of My Football Story from the Honest Football Podcast. This week, Charlie catches up with Linfield new signing Michael Newbury to talk about his brilliant career in the game so far. Michael, a Northern Irish youth international, came through in the Newcastle Academy, had a bit of a late start in football and a unique route into the Newcastle Academy, and he talks to us a little bit about that. He also talks about winning the much-coveted Jackie Milburn trophy whilst there and the impact that potentially had on his development and the pressure he put on himself as a young player. We also talk about the impact of injuries and the situation that then eventually led to him leaving Newcastle and taking a slightly unconventional route of going to play in Iceland. He had a brilliant spell there and played first-team football for a number of years and we talked to him about taking that slightly unorthodox move and in this January transfer window just gone, Michael has moved back to Linfield in Northern Ireland, a massive institution and a club that means a lot to him and his family. So we talked to him a little bit about that move and of course his plans for the future as a footballer and beyond as well. We can't thank Michael enough for giving up his time. If you do enjoy the interview, please do put a thumbs up on it. Subscribe down below for regular content from the Honest Football Podcast. But this is Michael Newbury's football story and we really hope you enjoy it. Mike, well, I really appreciate you taking the time. Obviously, uh, we're, when we're recording this, you've just had, uh, you know, it's breakfast time, etc. I'm at work, so, you know, I appreciate you sort of squeezing us in. No problem at all, mate, no problem. So, we're going to talk about your career and, you know, how you've ended up at Linfield and all of that. And, you know, I'll be honest, uh, considering how early you are into your career, you've had quite a journey already. But before we do that with any players you speak to, um, we always go back to your first ever football memory. So, you know, be it sort of playing uh, in the garden, watching the game. What was your first ever memory of the beautiful game, really? Well, so there was a little field next to where I lived and there was two trees and we would always play singles. You know what singles is? Like, yeah. It's where there was crazy. like one goalkeeper. Yeah, and 10, 15 outfield players just <laughs> all free for all. So we would all just play that and just scramble everywhere on the field. That was the first memories. Like, But I didn't, I was never like properly into football when I was a kid. I didn't start playing for a team until I was about 11. And then I went on so and so and started playing on at Newcastle, Red House Farm, and then went to Iceland and then came here. Yeah, I was going to say, just in terms of, I suppose, um, I think you call it singles, depending on which part of the country you're in, it's always got different names, isn't it? You know, like uh, that sort of thing. But um, okay. before we go on about you sort of going to, to Newcastle and all that, I mean, you probably answered one of my next questions, which you said about maybe not getting into football till you may be a little bit older by a lot of people's standards. Um, I was going to, I always ask like, were you better than everyone at school? Because obviously you went on to play, prof- you, you know, you are playing professionally. So, or as you say, was it a slower journey for you? Yeah, not necessarily. I wasn't. I wasn't always the best in school. I wasn't. I wouldn't even put myself in the top ten to be honest with you, because I was never like an interest for us as a kid. I would be more in like running around, you know, climbing trees and doing stuff like that. So I wasn't. I wouldn't even say I was one of the top ten to be honest with you. As time went on, and I got better and I got better and I got better. So then eventually, I got the best in the school. <laughs> Well, I was going to say, in terms of that, obviously, where did that inspiration come from? Was it from watching, like, you know, going to a ground, watching a game or, you know, that sort of thing, really? It's all, all my friends would be playing it. So if I didn't play football with them, I probably wouldn't have no friends. Yeah. You know, like, all of my friends loved it. So then I started to, like, when I went to train them with one of them just because he was, he was my best friend. And then when he would go to training, I would have nothing to do. So when he went to training, I just said, can I come to training with you? And I went on then, started training, and then I went on a trial with a, a bigger boys club, and then just so on. In terms of that, did you ever go to watch much in terms of actually going to a ground, you know, like what live football, that sort of thing, or not really? Nah, I just, just at a young age, I just wasn't interested in it. Yeah. I like playing on video games and stuff like that. A little bit what, like, the generation is now, you know what I mean? You're ahead of the, cur- the curve in that sense. I suppose, like you say, though, actually, in terms of you, you've mentioned about your friends, I suppose the, the, the northeast of England, particularly is that Newcastle and the sort of surrounding area, yeah. it's got such a reputation for football, hasn't it? You know, how did that then come about? You mentioned Red House Farm, obviously quite a big club in the area, you know, and how did that then lead to you ending up at Newcastle? Just sort of talk us through those few years of that journey. Seven side tournament. I was playing a seven side tournament. I was, I was in 11 a side, but we were just having like this little. Um, small tournament in Newcastle for, for not like seven aside kit, like just training, playing that. And I was there and there was a, a scout from Newcastle there and he asked us if I wanted to come on a six week trial. So I just snapped it up straight away. And I went, I was got off to go to Hartlepool and another team, but I can't remember the other team. So but obviously I'm going to pick Newcastle because it's all my family support Newcastle and I support Newcastle now. But at the time, obviously I wasn't really interested in this. 
Yeah, in that sense, then obviously we'll talk about your sort of time at Newcastle. But you, you know, as an, at the moment, I don't want to, I don't want to pigeonhole your career. But you, you know, you've played predominantly as a defender. Were you play? Is that how you began, sort of there, or were you? I was playing as a winger, but then I obviously got dropped back and then back and then back. <laughs> <laughs> how did you find that then, in terms of that? And sort of, do you, do you know why that sort of happened? So I assume when when you're at Newcastle, obviously, did they just see something in you, maybe more as a centre half or a defender that that maybe you didn't see yourself? Because when I first started football, like. I didn't have a football and brain because I never had an interest in it. I didn't think about passes. I didn't think about me runs or anything like that or positioning. So they just dropped this back because I was physically, I was quite tall. I was fast. You know what I mean? I was strong for like my age. So they dropped this back and then I done all right as a, as a defender because of their attributes. But that, that was basically it. I, I think anyways, you know, I haven't spoke to my old managers. I haven't asked what his, um, his thoughts are, but. Yeah. You mentioned about going to obviously Newcastle and, and I suppose, I mean, outside of your family, it's such a massive institution, you know, such great history, so many et cetera players. Did you feel a bit of pressure then, but I suppose, especially with your family being Newcastle fans? I know you were only at the time, we talked about when you were a youth player, but still, did you feel a bit of pressure in that? Of course, I'm only a young kid thinking that I'm destined to be big things and I've got to be, I've got to be performing every week and I've got to be the best every week. It's a lot of pressure on a young kid, you know what I mean? And trying to, trying to prove yourself. And then the pressure as you get older just gets even more and more and more. Mm. And how, how did you, because I suppose there would have been maybe players that you, in your youth teams, et cetera, that you'd played with who maybe have been at the clubs, I'm just using this as an example, but from like seven, eight, nine, ten years old, whereas you've obviously came to it a bit later. Do you think that gave you a bit of a, not a head start, but you weren't, because you get here some lads who are so burnt out by the time they get to 16 because they've been doing it for the last seven or eight years. Do you think that gave you a bit of an advantage perhaps? or? I would say hunger-wise. Yeah, I was hungry, but not footballing wise. No, I was. They were head and shoulders above us before I went. Technically, they had they had been taught tactics, you know, at a young age. I hadn't been taught tactics at a, at my boys' club or nothing like that. It was just go out and play and enjoy yourself. Yeah, but then it starts to go like you have to have like a routine, training, train, training at a certain time, everything coming with your kit perfect. I would just turn up with my Newcastle top on and stuff, you know. I wore, I wore um, any kit I wanted, you know what I mean? I didn't even have to wear a Newcastle stuff. I could just go in with my tracksuit and the boys club training. But then I have to like be prepared, have my boots clean, have shin pads on for training and all that kind of stuff. So It's an incredible rise. I think, to be honest, we, we've, uh, you know, we've interviewed quite a few players and I don't think many have had that short turnaround like you have of really not being fast. And then suddenly then you're a professional club. But before you start looking at sort of first team football and stuff, it's got different names, isn't it? Scholarships or whatever it is. But essentially you sign a contract. What's that like in terms of, because obviously I suppose you're trying to get a pro deal, but you're still playing as part of a team. So, you know, not everyone's going to get that deal. How does that sort of work? And, you know, how do you how do you approach those sort of situations in that sense? To be honest with you, I didn't really think much about that, like on that part of it. I just thought about me as an individual, you know, I, I just thought about trying to be the best I can and, and stuff like that mm. and improving every day I could. But obviously injury set us back and you've all get on to that though. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was going to say, unfortunately, it's a... It's one of the few negatives we'll have to talk about today. But before we do that, another positive, and you have, you'll have to give, forgive my pronunciation, but, you know, and during your time at Newcastle, and I know it's something that gets mentioned a lot, and we try not to always ask the same questions, but you obviously did win the, the Ward Jackie Trophy, or, you know, one named after Jackie Milburn. Again, my accent doesn't really lend itself really well to that, does it? But obviously, there's so many amazing players who've won that, and it is, you know, given to the best player of, of your sort of intake and all that kind of thing. Is there then, do you feel like a pressure off of the back of that? Like, right now, I probably need to deliver a bit because you've been set apart from everyone else almost in a weird way. Well, at the time I, I received this, like, obviously I thought there's all these, like, fantastic players in my team. And I didn't rate myself higher than some of the people in the team. So, like, you know, like, I didn't think that I really deserved it. Do you know what I mean? But when I look back at it, like, the stuff I had done and stuff, of course, you know, like, it's just a footballing thing you doubt yourself constantly you always have doubts and you know about your ability and your footballing ability and then I got injured not long after it so he made things 10 times worse for us yeah I was gonna say we're sort of gonna touch on that in a, in a sense obviously but before we do that I suppose when you're playing as part of like from the youth football there would have been times you'd have maybe even if it was just you know playing in a reserve game or going training there's a night tournament in in Warwick I think it is we'll play against Chelsea Ajax all them kind of teams it was like yeah I, I did well. I was getting interest from different clubs for us. And then that's when Newcastle offered us a two-year scholar and a one-year pro. So I got offered it as a three-year thing. Yeah. I got that. And then 
I kind of relaxed a little bit, which I wish I never, you know, like I thought oh, I'm here for the next three years. But looking back at it, like it was a wrong thought process. I thought, you know, I should have been on every day. No, but I think it, it, it's testament to you now that you're still in the game because I think that would have, you know, get, we'll get onto that in a minute. But that, you know, what happened after that might have finished off a few. But just in terms of that, you know, going from maybe playing a bit of youth football and then when you go and work around the first team and, you know, even if it's just in training, et cetera, what is the difference between the two footballs, between like, you know, youth football and, and senior football, for want a better phrase? Is it, is it quicker? Is it stronger? Do you know, what's it like from a footballing perspective? Quicker, stronger, it's more brutal. If you don't have a good game, they'll tell you straight away. Right. Whereas academy level, you could get beat 6 nil and they'll be coming and just say, come on, lads, head up, next yeah. game. But if you have a bad game, yeah, they'll come in and they'll tell you straight away, you know what I mean? So you have to be on the ball every game. There's no room for mistakes. It's fascinating to hear that, really, because I think it's so it's such a, a results-driven business, isn't it? You know, end of the day, if you don't perform, I suppose. Exactly. If you don't win games and get to places that you need to reach, they lose money. And that's their business, to keep the teams running and getting progressing and progressing it's an excellent we've never really had that sort of answer it's an excellent point actually i suppose it is they're investing in you and i suppose they want to return from it don't they in that sense exactly if you if you hire somebody and they're not doing the job that you ask them to do that's the way it is you know what i mean you're, you're gonna get taught we'll, we'll get the, the the sort of the negative part out of the way and you mentioned about injuries and it's one of the few things that you know these grassroots fans and coaches etc can relate to is being injured how did you find things like the rehab and, and talk us through some of those injuries and i'm not trying to make you feel bad but it's just it's fascinating to hear that mindset. It's perfectly fine talking about it. You know, I'm just past because now I haven't had an injury for nearly two and a half seasons. That took us out for more than two weeks. At the time, I wasn't getting in the team before I'd done me back. Like, I wasn't like, because I moved up a level. I went from under 18s to 23s at about, I think I was about 17 or something, or a little bit like, turning 18 or something. I was sitting on the bench for nearly half the season. So I thought, I'm going to have to do a lot more extra. He obviously thinks I'm maybe not physical enough. Right. Or, um, you know, just I was like trying to, do everything I could to get into it and I've like overworked my back and it's, I put a hairline fracture on the bottom of my back on like on one of the vertebrae I think it was so I took us out for five months and then I've rushed to try and get back into the team and then I've hairline fractured the other side so I took us out for like another nine months and I had two hairline fractures now because of this at the bottom of my back so that was that was the main injury in terms of that, obviously, I mean, that's such a pivotal point of your career, I suppose, because like you say, you've just established yourself, etc. How did you find going in on a day-to-day -day basis? Because, uh, you know, the rehab was horrendous for me, and I'm not even a professional. It was just sat at home doing, like, I don't know, boring squats, etc. Obviously, how did you find that when you maybe seeing your teammates out there and you're having to do different stuff in a weird way? Exactly the same. It feels like you kind of, because you're injured, you kind of work your body. Do you know what I mean? You just have to do minimal stuff. And there's somebody whose profession is, to work hard and do stuff like that. I just felt like I was just sitting, doing nothing constantly. I wasn't progressing. Everybody else is progressing. I'm going like this, they're going like that. So it just, it's obviously hard to deal with, you know, seeing people do well in your position, stuff like that. And I was getting closer and closer to the end of my contract. Mm -hmm. So I started to worry about where I'm going to be at the end of it. Is, is football for me? Because I'm, am I going to keep pulling me, doing me back? You know, I thought it was going to be a reoccurring injury, everything like that. Just all in your head just starts like manifesting in your head. No, I think it's a, a testament to you then that you're still playing now. Because, like you say, I mentioned it earlier, but I think going through the experience you had, uh, you know, quite a lot of pros have dropped out of football and, and you know done whatever they've done. So I think it's a testament to you that you, you stayed in the game and, and your sort of mental strength. And I think it's something sometimes as fans we don't always see you know we just see so and so yeah. playing on a saturday and actually we don't see that journey you've been on and having to work through no. that kind of thing you know so yeah. um on a positive note we'll go you know back to your sort of career we're just going to park the club side for a minute and talk about international football so obviously you're playing in northern ireland now but you've also represented northern ireland how does that sort of uh, rank for you in terms of against the stuff you achieved obviously on a personal level you won that trophy at newcastle and all the things you've done as a player how does international football rank against all of that not for me like right yeah. Not for me, my dad. I've I've never seen my dad cry. Right. I've scored. I've scored. I scored a goal against Faroe Islands for the U in the Euros. Yeah. I mean, that's the first time I've seen my dad cry. He cried. He cried when I went and seen him after the game. Do you know what I mean? So that that's a bit more mm. personal to me. You know what I mean? Because it's obviously a great feeling. You know what I mean? They make your parents proud and stuff like that. I was just going to ask that really, like if if you don't mean, and you don't feel you have to answer this if you don't want to, but. Comparing the two of winning that, you know, that, that Jackie Milburn trophy at Newcastle and obviously scoring and essentially sent your country to the, the Euros. 
if you had to choose one as a, a moment you could sort of bottle and open up every now and then and take and remember which which of the two if you had to choose one it's going for Northern Ireland 100% right. that sticks with us it sticks with us a lot more I think about like it you know gets brought up a lot more and stuff and obviously with my dad that thing my dad's dad he's, he was a Linfield supporter as well and yeah. obviously he's supported Northern Ireland and stuff so it's just a proud moment for my family me and my family not just for me when I won the war jacket it was like it was all about me, me, me. But when I scored that, it was like about my family. That's a fascinating insight. I think, you know, an incredibly selfless attitude. In terms of that then, obviously you mentioned earlier about getting towards the end of your, your contract at Newcastle. And then you, you took probably, I don't want to say unorthodox, but it's a different move to a lot of players in, in that situation. But I've tried so often to try and pronounce the name of the team that you signed for, but we'll go through that in, in a bit. You know, what was your sort of mindset when you were coming to the end of that time? And could you have gone elsewhere? What, how did that sort of happen? So... My old manager at Northern Ireland was Stevie Craigan, and he was a manager of Motherwell on the 20s. Right. So I was there. And I had actually played for Newcastle against Sunderland in the um, Cup at the end of my contract. It was probably my last game for Newcastle. And I'd done my knee, I tore ligaments in my knee. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not lying, I didn't have no luck at Newcastle with injuries, but I'd done my knee, and I was meant to be out for like six, seven weeks. The, the um, physio said, and I was like, it's just not possible for us to be out that long. I need to go on, tri on trial places and that. So like, I rushed it back. About, about, I've cut about a month off it myself. I just told him, like, I'll just strap it off, you know, wait until it... So it was still... I was playing with it, like, painful. So I went on trial at Motherwell, and when I was there, I was doing OK, but I, like, not as good as I wanted to. Do you know what I mean? Like, not the best of my ability. So he wasn't unsure, he was unsure of, like, what the contract would be. He said that there would be one there, but he wasn't sure of, like, everything that would be in place, like, if I needed an apartment or stuff like that. And my agent, Nick, he's called Nick, he rang me and said, I've got an option for you to go to Iceland, but you'd have to leave tomorrow. And I was in Scotland at the time. So I sat down with my dad and I was like, do, what do I do? And take this first team football guaranteed I was to play first team football or possibly sit on an under 20s bench again so I thought to myself I've got to I've got to take the first team football even if it takes us elsewhere and you know I've done if I just stay abroad so I just took it and I just went for it and it's worked out for us you know what I mean so I'm happy I've, I'm happy about it I was about to say it's, it's you know it inspired move in that sense but I suppose it's um I think we sometimes, as I say, from an outside perspective, we just look at one player moving from here to here and, and don't understand the other stuff that goes on around it, like you say. But I think it's such a short career that I suppose, you know, if there's honour for a first team football, you, you're going you're gonna to take that, aren't you, in that sense? If, just if you could say it, because I really struggle. In terms of the team you signed for in Iceland, how would you, what are they, what's the official pronunciation of it? Vikinga Olasvik. Right, OK. Now you said that, I won't have to say it again. So when I refer to it, no, but on a serious note, you know, obviously you mentioned about how that move came about. Obviously, it was a, a you know next day sort of thing. What was your sort of initial thoughts when you got over there, and and how different was it to your experiences of playing in England compared to, to over there at the beginning? So at the beginning, right, as this sounds crazy, but the first game I got there, I went for a 50-50 and someone fingered the bottom of my heel when I was right. getting a pain. So I, I missed like a week's worth a week's worth of training on the game. So I thought to myself, I can't believe <laughs> that the first game I've got here, I've did did it again. So. I mean, head was gone completely. I'm not gonna lie, my head was gone. But then, I, lucky enough, it fixed itself in about a week and a half, two weeks, and I got back and then I hit the floor running. Do you know what I mean? I was playing, playing every game. There was a gym, the facilities were fantastic there, so I was just in the gym every day, eating well, everything. I was just happy, mm. and I was secluded from everything. I was probably about two and a half hours away from Reykjavik, so I was in this tiny little town in in Iceland. So I just got my head down and worked on it. I suppose a great environment to obviously to, to learn your trade in that sense. But in terms of the stuff outside of football there, you know, were you living in sort of digs? Were, did, were, were the players quite good at uh, accepting and taking you in? Obviously, given your, you know, I suppose you'd be a different background to them. And did you have to try and learn a language or were they all speaking English? Sort of just tell us that sort of side of the game as well. We all, we all spoke English, but my first season, it was like I was mostly on my own. Yeah, and to be fair, my agent helped us massively with that. Like Nick, and Nick helped us so much because I was alone in my apartment like most of the time and I was just you know speaking to him every day and he helped us helped us a lot you know keep me keep me like wits about us and not want to like turn back and go back to English football and I stuck it out and the first first five months well it wasn't easy for us mentally because I was by myself I was first time I'd lived away from my parents properly you know I was like a little bit 
wanting to come home, homesick, I could say. But then I just r- rode it out, and then it's eventually I got friends in there that I'm still friends with now, you know, good friends. I was the first English person to come. Then the season after, we had three. Then the last season, we had more and more. I just oh, kept really? more. They were starting to like English players because they, they had a lot of Spanish players before before I came and had um, some guy from Sierra Leone and Ghana and stuff like that. Um, just in terms of that then, Michael, you know, you have spoke about stuff off the pitch, but in terms of the differences on the pitch, obviously, you know, we, I think from the outside, in, English fans have a bit of a, a complex about uh, European football and it's a lot slower or a bit more boring. Obviously, I, I don't subscribe to that. I try and watch as much football as I can. But from your perspective on the pitch, is there a big difference between playing, you know, in fo- football in, say, Iceland and England in that sense? Physicality. Right. I'm a guy. The, some of the players I've played with in Iceland have been better some, and then some of the players I've played against in under-23s level. You get you get caught up in a little bubble and when you're in academy football, it's not real. It doesn't seem real until you can hit men's football and everything like that stuff. So I played against some fantastic players in, in obviously academy level that are playing like the likes of Rashford and stuff like that. And I played with Hatton Ben Arfa. Yeah, do you know what I mean? It's a bit crazy. Then I go to Iceland and there's some players that are I'm not even joking, that are like not far off their level. They right. just haven't been seen by big clubs or something. I wouldn't say the standard was far and far above, you know what I mean? And so in terms of that, obviously, we'll, we'll sort of get you up to speed now of where we are now, obviously, at, at, at Linfield. But just before we sort of do that, how do you look back on your time as a whole at, in, in the Icelandic league? And is it a, a positive experience for you? Really positive. The best for best time in my life playing football. I enjoyed every every game I was playing. I played carefree. I wouldn't have, The pressure was nowhere near as much as in Newcastle. I thoroughly enjoyed the full time I was there. But I'm happy that I've made this choice and played here. Well, I was about to say, we'll move on to that. Obviously, we mentioned about Jackie Milburn and obviously there's the whole symmetry because he ended up at Linfield himself. So I suppose there is a, a certain symmetry. Yeah, that's um, a legend. For me, like, Irish, Irish League football is something we're massively into as a podcast. and that, But we'll get to how and why you ended up at Linfield. You obviously mentioned about your family sort of ties, but was there other options at the end of your time in Iceland and, and why Linfield, really, I suppose? Yeah, I had, I had like three or four teams in Iceland that were interested. I had a team in um, Norway. I, had, I think even my agent said there was some in Sweden, but as soon as Linfield popped up, I didn't even want to know the rest of them, to be honest with you, because I worked with David Healy before and Ross, the assistant. It was a no-brainer for me, you know what I mean? Plus, he's, his own career spoke for itself. Oh, yeah, and the thing is, well, Linfield's such an institution, isn't it, if Irish football, you know, uh, Irish league football, it's, it's incredible, really. And I suppose, I mean, we spoke to the, the chairman a few months ago, uh, Roy McGiven, who you might have come across, I suppose, in your, you know, since you've signed. But um, I think what I f- find fascinating about the club is there seems to be a vision. And I think, obviously, you're now part of that. You know, it's always like every five years, etc. And I think it's so great to see a club that, that pulls in that direction. But in terms of your sort of settling, and you've only been at the time recording there a few weeks, how have you found the sort of initial period? Again, has everyone been quite sort of accepting? And All of that have been fine ever since I've come. But it's obviously hard to build a relationship with players when I'm not in the team. So I've just got in the team yesterday. I, sat, I was on the bench yesterday. And that's the first involvement I've had since I've come. But I, wasn't, I haven't played a game since October last season. Well, yeah, that was going to be my sort of last last question about, you know, in terms of your career so far. Obviously, because of the way the Icelandic League runs uh, in terms of what time of year, did that weigh on your mind a little bit when you were thinking about your next move, that wherever you go, I suppose you're going to have to take a, a little while to get up to speed again or not really? I would have preferred to win from finishing October and start playing in December straight away. I yeah. would prefer not to have a four-month four month period where I was just sitting, not playing games and stuff like that. So... But it is, that's the way football is, you know what I mean? Like, I kind of changed that that side of it. I yeah. took that decision to play over the summer, and now I've took the decision to go back into in a longer season. Because the season's only four or five months over in Iceland, so it, it usually finishes a lot, lot sooner. That's fascinating to hear that, actually. So, in terms of your ambitions for the future, I'm not asking you to comment on particular clubs, etc., but have you ever thought about what you're going to do? Obviously, you're still very early on in your career. Have you ever thought about what you might do once your career's over? Because obviously it has to finish at some point, as much as we don't like that. You know, have you ever thought about what you might do after that? Or is that not really in your process so early on in your career at the minute? You're not going to believe this. I'm not in line. My girlfriend asked us yesterday, like, have you ever thought about what you want to do after? And I want, I, I've not, I've, I've always wanted to be a chef. I don't know why, but I've <laughs> always enjoyed cooking. I've always enjoyed yep. stuff like that. And I, want, and I took cooking lessons when I was at Newcastle as well. I right. thoroughly enjoyed it, so... I could be a chef by 10, well, 15 years. Whenever I'm in Northern Ireland over to visit the indoors, if you need anyone trying out any food, I'll be, I'm more than happy to help out with you. So it's, 
Oh, I've got some wraps. <laughs> some wraps. <laughs> Definitely. I'm always up for that. No, no, we're, we're, we're big, big foodies on here as well. So I'll be well up for that. I did say to you earlier, we wouldn't always talk about, you know, the same sort of questions you always get asked, but we always finish with some quick fire ones. So what's your favourite ground you've ever played at? St. James's Scott. It's just St. James's definitely. played there in a youth cup game and there was 11,000 people turned up for this youth cup game against Chelsea. Yeah. And I was playing and that I think that's why it's just such a special stadium for us because that is the first, that's the biggest crowd I've ever played in front of. So it was just crazy. Yeah. And I just loved it. Every minute of it. No, of course. Like no. Five minutes going out like that. <laughs> well, I was about to ask you, how did you find that in terms of that? You know, your what is your what you know, not just there, I suppose it's a quick, quick question actually, anyway. In terms of any big games in your career, are you quite nervous or are you quite excited? How does that play out for you? So before the game, all the lads in the change room were saying, ah, oh, there'll be about five, six hundred people turn up. But we didn't know that the club put all the tickets for free so you didn't have to pay for it. <laughs> so they came running out like this <laughs> to warm up. And there's been like 11, they've had to open up more of the stadium because it was getting full. <laughs> so we, we just went, boom, just on a team. Absolutely. Came back out shaking. We were drawing one one and then they beat us an extra time. Don Salang, Tammy Abraham, all them uh, players were playing. It's not a bad, uh, not a bad team to sort of play against, is it? In that sense, but an incredible environment to obviously play in. This next one, like, we sort of started this recently with, particularly you know, play, players who are still playing. Um, you're going to laugh at this, but it's just something I'm fascinated by about is football boots. So across your career so far, if you could say you had a favourite pair of boots, Stevie Gerrard, you know the um, predators with the thing that goes over the front. Yes, we used to get them for free off Newcastle. Really? Just be like, oh, yeah. What country do you have out of interest as well? Because obviously being a set, uh, defender is a bit of a stigma, isn't it, about what colour boots you should wear? Red and black. I have red and black. Well, I was going to say, I think it, even in grassroots football, if you're if you're in, you know, if you're in a, a back four, if you've got quite luminous boots, you're put, making a bit of a name for yourself, aren't you? Oh, really, in that sense. Well, I, wear, I wear luminous ones now. I've got, <laughs> I think I've got pink and yellow. <laughs> I'm not even joking. The difference is you're good enough to get away with it, whereas people like me aren't. So, you know, that's, <laughs> in terms of that, if this is going to be divisive and upset people, I really don't want you to answer this because it's only um, a bit of fun. But if you had to pick a favourite manager or coach that you've played under so far. When I was a kid, there was a manager called Gary Ives in Newcastle. And Mark Bollum, he was my first manager. You know, he's the one who taught us football, how to play football properly. So I'd say Mark Bollum and Gary Ives, both of them, made us who play I am now, like... In terms of the next one, so there's two for this. It's, 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 given your career, you've got some incredible names to, to choose from. Who's the best player you've played with and the best player you've played against? I know you probably get asked that a lot, but it is fascinating to hear. Probably with Hatton Ben Arthur, definitely. Yeah. And against Marcus Rashford. In terms of, uh, obviously, you mentioned about Mar Marcus Rashford. He's obviously, you know, outside of football, he's doing some amazing stuff. But what made him the best player you played against? What was it about? I scored two against well, that's what That's what I did. <laughs> <laughs> got her off the corner. She ever passed two people and whacked it in. And the <laughs> other one was just counter attacked us. No, I, I mean to be honest, I think it's a, he's you know an incredible player. I watched him last night, obviously against West Ham in the FA Cup, and even then he has moments of just absolute brilliance, doesn't he? But um, the last uh, last question we always ask anyone: if you tell us about your two favourite games, the best one you've ever played in, and your favourite one you've ever watched, whether it be at the ground or on TV. Best game in Norway and played in Russia against Norway. Mm. I scored a goal, so that one's probably... I'm, I'm going to always see that one. I've scored two goals, and that, that's that's the one. Watched probably when Newcastle came back from getting beat off Arsenal, when okay. Czech Tioti scored that left-footed volley. Czech Tioti with his left foot whacked outside the box. Fantastic. No, I agree. Michael, this has been an absolute pleasure. I've genuinely really enjoyed talking to you so much. And it's fascinating to hear your career. You know, one thing I wanted to really quickly touch on was just your determination as a, as a pro is second to none. So, you know, I think it's a real testament to you and, as a character to come through what you have and be where you are now. So, obviously, all the best for the season and we'll, we'll keep in contact soon. Thanks, mate. I'll see you later. <laughs>